Hey, David, how's it going? Hey, good. Thanks, man. How you doing? Great, great. Always good to talk. We uh, Again, we get to talk to Rachel last week, and uh, you and I are chatting a bunch about how much we enjoyed that episode, just getting her to talk about her new Netflix show and just some of the things that she's seeing in the Airbnb space. And so always just awesome to connect on that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know. We we uh, we talked after that recording where we were both like, maybe short term rental is something we got to do more. <laughs> like, we both got really excited about short term right. rentals after that. Again, um, <laughs> but I know what one thing that like really stuck with me too that like I you know days later we're still talking about is uh, she she had this line about how everything is figure outable, and I just thought like that's so good because there's there's a big difference between you know. It, it, everything that we learn in pharmacy school, pharmacology and therapeutics versus building code and tenant management, right? Like we, we don't learn anything about building code in pharmacy school. And after everything that a pharmacist invests in training for their profession, there's this intimidation that there's this enormous learning curve that you can't get into real estate investing until you do this, put in the same amount of effort and energy and, and years of everything and it's just not that way. And I think that that's what Rachel highlighted too, is that everything is figure outable. I just, I just love that line. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's a space where you can, you can fail a little bit and be fine. Right. Again, like you said, we're so hardwired as pharmacists to say like, if you, if you mess up, like that's a patient's life on the line in real estate, like you, you can mess up, learn from it and move on. And that's hard for some of us to grasp and get over that edge. Um, but it's something I've learned as an agent, something I've learned as an investor. And it's something that, again, I think we want to bring a little bit more attention to because it's easy to get lost in that you can't make any mistakes kind of a mindset. And that's that's not where we want you guys to be when you're thinking about real estate investing. Yeah. And, and there's so much um, that I think in real estate talks about catastrophic mistakes versus just kind of simple mistakes mm -hmm. that are easy to fix. Like if you go in and you paint a room a color that you really don't like, you know, in about two hours of the paint roll, you can correct that mistake. Like nothing, well, uh, sure, there are some things that can be a really big deal, <laughs> but a lot of the mistakes that we're fearful of that really cause a analysis paralysis among pharmacists is, you know, that's just really not a big deal. It's a pretty easy thing to fix if it goes wrong. Um, and so I, I, think that there's a lot out there too in the real estate space that talks about just the unicorns and rainbows of real estate investing is easy and everybody is successful about it. And I think that we all know like our inner like cynical nature a little bit is like, nah, can't be. <laughs> so I, I think that us leery pharmacists, they we have this like, what am I missing? What happens when something goes wrong? Because eventually it will, right? Yeah. And I had, I had somebody ask me that I, I had uh, a meeting with a client recently, a potential client rather. And he was just learning about real estate investing and says, Nate, I want to start investing. And he's like, what's the catch? Like, does this actually work? Like I keep reading about it and like, where's the, I'm waiting for the, like the gotcha moment. And so yeah, I, I totally get it. And I, that's what we kind of want to talk about. Right. So you and I were talking before the recording, a little bit offline, kind of planning this out but maybe we'll go through some of our own investing journeys, just some of the hiccups that we've run into and how, you know, while they seemed like a big deal in that moment, they were actually really easy to figure out and, and move on from. Yeah. And because at, at the same time as, as we want to push back against this analysis paralysis issue that causes some people to never get started is uh, we, we also don't want to come off like, you know, don't plan, don't worry, just dive in head first and, and don't worry about anything. Because there is this healthy tension between learning and analysis and thoughtful, methodical, kind of our, our clinical approach to things, but also diving in and, and, and still learning as you go a little bit. And so that, that tension is really important. And it's important to have, you know, an idea before you write an offer of how the numbers are going to work. It's important to know what repainting and reflooring a house might cost, but you don't necessarily need to know precisely how many GFCI outlets need to go in a kitchen and the distance between wiring, because that's probably overkill for, for what you actually need to know as an investor. Instead, you just need to know a good electrician, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. In that example, right, hiring a good electrician makes all the difference. Part of really a lot of what we talk about is the importance of identifying that professional that you can rely on, somebody that you can turn to for a consult so that you don't have to know every aspect of every piece of investing. You just need to know the right people so that you can make that 
that right turn when you need to. So uh, let's jump in, David, let's talk through some examples, get to some of our old stories about, but things that have happened in the past to us. Yeah. And again, some of these are are kind of painful to relive and kind of embarrassing because these are the things about real estate that doesn't go well, right? But I know you you uh, shared one before you hit recording about a, a plumbing issue, a plumbing leak that was discovered in one of your rentals, which feels scary because I know that plumbing sounds expensive and water causes damage, right? Like that feels like a potentially catastrophic, really ugly thing, but this was something that was figure outable. Right. Yeah. It's funny. This example immediately comes to mind because when most people think about uh, plumbing issues, they think really bad. Right. And that's like the thing that scares them away from real estate for some reason. I think that's just whenever I hear somebody talk to me or try to talk out of real estate, that's the thing they go to is, oh, well, you're going to have a plumbing leak and then everything is terrible. Right. So this, this example is actually when I had a tenant for about, they were there for about six months and I wanted to do my first walkthrough on this property, but it was right in the middle of COVID. And so we didn't want to physically go there. We wanted to give our tenants some space. So I, I FaceTimed the tenant. I set up a whole, basically a FaceTime call to, to walk th- through the house with them. And we went through the whole house. He was really helpful to walk us through the whole house. Everything looked fantastic. We get to the basement and he's like, oh yeah. And sometimes that pl- that pipe has some water running down it, but it seems to be fine. We just mop it up when it gets bad. I'm like, sorry, what? <laughs> and so we go back and basically long story short, there was a huge crack in this pipe in the wall. It was an old cast iron pipe in an old house. Um, kind of a classic problem that we deal with here in Cleveland, Ohio. And the, the, the tenant didn't think it was a big deal. And even though we'd gone over with him several times, like, you know, th- th- these are things to identify early on and tell us about, they just didn't look at it like a big deal. Well, I finally got my plumber out there they had to cut a huge hole in the wall. They cut out a big six foot long section of cast iron pipe. Um, but what was nice was that, you know, I just took it one step at a time. It was, okay, start with a plumber, identify where the problem is coming from, then get a quote from that guy and and just keep taking steps down the road until we got it fixed. We even got to the point where he fixed the leak, had replaced all the pipes, everything was ship shape. But now I had a huge hole in the wall and I had to patch that all up. And it was the old lath and plaster, not classic drywall. Well, luckily the plumber knew a lath and plaster guy, had that guy over literally as he was finishing the job, starting on the next part of the job and it got all taken care of. So I didn't know anything about fixing plumbing going into that problem, but I didn't have to, right? Because I was able to identify the right professionals and then rely on them to to take the steps forward. So what started off as a simple walkthrough during a, a regular six month you know, look back period turned into kind of a, kind of a mess, but we were able to sort it out pretty quickly. No, so I, I think that there's a lot that's really good about that thought process though, where you're like, you know, first let's figure out what's going on figure out what professional needs to deal with that as more people need to be involved. You do. Um, I also like that you shared, um, training your tenants <laughs> to let you know about these issues because absolutely. I know that some tenants fall into that, like, uh, people pleaser kind of personality type, and they don't want to complain when something's broken. Right. But you and I, as people that have owned rentals for a while, know that these things are so much easier to fix before they get really bad. So, like, I would much rather know that, like, hey, there's this little thing yep. because it's so much easier to fix a little thing than a big thing when it gets worse. So, yeah, and it's a good reminder too that that even the best training of your tenants, again, like I know we went over that stuff, but they're gonna miss stuff. They're gonna not think of certain things as being an issue that you might perceive as a bigger issue. And so do your walkthroughs. Um, again, I recommend every six months or have your property manager do your walkthroughs because it's a it's the way to catch those things before they do become big problems. Yeah, and and I think one of the things that can cause people some panic too is is like not really having a lot of context for cost. So can you help us through what something like that would cost? Like is that like a ten thousand dollar plumbing thing or is that a ten thousand dollar wall thing? Or like how does how does that all factor yeah, in? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something where like the emergency fund for that rental really can can come in handy. Um I think for that it was I think it ended up being around eight hundred dollars in plumbing work. Now I've got a great plumber, somebody that I worked with for for years, and so we get really uh, great pricing. We're not paying like a commercial plumber type pricing. Um, if I had had Rotor Rooter or one of the bigger companies out there, it'd probably have been double that cost, quite honestly, um, because they're cutting out cast iron pipe. They're replacing it with PVP, PVC pipe. So you're paying for the, the materials, the actual physical things that need to be put into the wall, but also the time that it takes to do that. And so you can pay uh, you know pretty high labor rates on, especially on on professionals like like plumbers and electricians. Um, so I think the the 
the repair itself was around eight hundred dollars for the plumbing work, um, and then the wall repair was I think like two hundred and fifty bucks. I mean, the guy was was awesome, and and I, I again really happy to find somebody like that that knew what they were doing and weren't, wasn't going to charge an arm and a leg. So, um, kind of goes back to having good contacts. I think one of the best things that um, one of the things that helps that's helped me the most in the past is my work as a real estate agent has gotten me this Rolodex of people that I can turn to based on whatever problem I'm going to run into. Um, and it just makes that handling that much easier, right? So when a problem comes up, I know exactly who I'm going to call and they can go out and get it fixed and taken care of. Yeah. I, I think that's really hopefully reassuring for a lot of people that even this plumbing issue of like a big piece of drain is replaced and then the wall and all this stuff, like that still ended up being like right about a thousand bucks. And yeah, by having those people or by knowing someone that knew somebody like you were, you were able to figure that out. Um, and I know that, you know, in, in today's market, the new property that, you know, if it, if that property cash flows, for instance, a hundred dollars a month, you know, you just lost almost a year of cash flow with a, with a repair like that. Um, that can also be kind of a hiccup for some, but you also mentioned an emergency fund. So I don't know, tell me a little bit about that and, and how you kind of factor all that in. Yeah, it's a really good point. It, like you said, you're almost burning a year's worth of profits if you're doing it, you know, really down to the the zero, right? So that's what we build in an emergency fund. We build in a repair budget so that every single month we're setting aside money in a, in a don't touch this fund that when those problems come up, I can draw from that and, and be able to pay for those things so that I'm not tapping the profits from that that rental, right? That's the whole goal with cash flow. I hear this all the time where people talk about, well, the cash flow in this place is $400 a month, $500, $600 a month, but that doesn't actually factor in setting aside money for reserves. And so we're really, really cognizant about that. Again, super risk averse, boring pharmacist over here. Like I don't want, I don't need the investment to make a ton of money. I need it to be safe for my tenants and I need it to take care of itself, right? So so when they're paying rent and we're setting money aside, we're doing that so that when something breaks, I can go fix it and I'm not taking money out of my pocket, right? That's, it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a long-term investment where that house is slowly being paid off. So that's really important to, to realize that, that I'm not sitting here using those profits, whatever they're, they might be, to take care of those repairs, we're setting aside money to, to handle these things when they come up down the road because they're going to come up. No, absolutely. I think I think another thing to factor into that too is that you know the the cash flow sometimes is a little thinner in that first year um, when you're just getting a property going, and then you've got those kind of initial maintenance things that come up and and things that you know. No matter how many walkthroughs you do, it seems like the first tenant that moves in, just because they're living there and they're looking at that stuff, they always find things. <laughs> and so, you know, being able to jump in and correct those issues right away too, sometimes that can feel like it starts to to eat into to profits and cash flow as well. Um, but you know, over time, like you said, this is not a get rich quick. This is a a slow burn. So yeah. over time, you know, the rents are going to progressively increase. That tenant may move out as you reset to market rent, you know, assuming that rent continues to increase, you'll continue to see more and more cash flow every month uh, because the mortgage is hopefully staying set. You're seeing more rent. So over time, it will hopefully also become a better and better investment, paying itself down, not something where you're going to get rich in the first year on a long-term rental property in a lot of cases. Yeah, exactly. Good, good point to clarify. So David, enough about water leaks for a second. Tell me about the furnace issue you were mentioning before. I, I we, we talked about this before we hit record. Yeah. So sadly, we've had a few furnace issues over the last few <laughs> years, but I feel like that's another one that, you know, people tend to associate what are those high ticket, high price right. issues, you know, furnace hits that list, right? And so we've had this in a few different circumstances um, that have messed up, you know, flips, rentals. Unfortunately, these are these are scary ones for sure. Yeah. So walk us through that example then. What, what happened recently or, or uh, you had an older furnace, right? Yeah, so there was there was one that um, happened not too long ago where uh, our our property manager, similar to what you're talking about, doing these walkthroughs. So that's that's not something that I do myself, but that's something that our property manager does mm-hmm. to do a walkthrough and just inspect. Um, one of the things they recommended was to have the furnace inspected because this particular house had like a 40 year old furnace, um, and we did the home inspection. We bought it. Home inspector said it's fine. The advice at the time was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's an old furnace, but it works. And if it's been working for 40 years, 
it may keep working. And in this case, it didn't. <laughs> um, it didn't work for that much longer. So at the furnace inspection, the uh, the readings were a little off. It was suggesting that it was uh, in need of repair. And it for a furnace that old, it's probably not worth repairing. It's, it's worth replacing at that point, um, which it was really uh, helpful that that was discovered by a furnace company, like an HVAC professional, because then we were able to go in and and start with the, like the the kind of questions like how urgent or emergent is this issue? Is this something that we need to take care of like tomorrow? Um, and and they were able to help walk us through like because we had done this proactively and it wasn't January, but it was in a season where you didn't have to run heat. Like then you don't need a furnace if you don't need heat. So we're like, okay, good. It's not emergent. We were able to to figure that out, and then they were able to get us a quote. And we were able to combine the quote with photos we had from the the inspection report and things like that. And then even just use that quote to shop around with a couple other vendors to see what they would do. So uh, again, because it wasn't emergent, we could we could say, you know, the this company said we need a furnace. It's this type of furnace, this size of furnace. We need a chimney liner or we don't. And like all the different details that would come on an itemized invoice like that. And we could shop that around with a couple companies. Um, we ended up just getting two quotes and, and the other person who was a, another furnace company we'd worked with before said, you know, I can't necessarily do it, uh, any cheaper and I'm booked like four weeks out. And if they can get to it next week, you should probably go with them. So it was, it was helpful to even hear things like that, that were reassuring in the process. And so we were able to get that fixed relatively quickly. And, and, uh, that ended up being still not too catastrophic. I want to say it was under $4,000 because it wasn't a very big house and it wasn't an emergency call. Yeah. So a little more expensive, but still pretty figure outable, especially with your stepwise approach, right? Do A, then B, then C, follow advice from experts in B and C. Like I, I really like that that stepwise process. And it doesn't sound like you spent too much time either, right? It'll, you said only about 15 minutes to get that handle, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, for when the property manager is doing that initial work, and then you're just really getting these phone calls mm -hmm. and shopping prices, like that ends up not being all that much work, and it doesn't uh, necessarily even end up being you know time sensitive work. This, these are these are calls I can make in the evening, you know, after work, and and all that. It ends up not being too terrible of an issue, and even things too where um, my property manager offered to take care of it. I just wanted to be a little more hands on with one of these first ones. So if it was something I just really couldn't do property managers there to shop quotes and, and do all that work as well. Nice. And I guess one of the things that I think about too, whenever there's a problem, right? Just like this, is there something we could have been doing in advance? Like you mentioned, you had this initial inspection. It, was there something you could have done to prevent that from being a real time fix? Something where you had to jump on it and start doing these quotes in real time? Um, yeah. Not necessarily for this one. I think this was just an issue of old age, sure. but one of our other uh, furnace issues that we <laughs> ran into was uh, we we bought a house that was a, a fixer up or needed some work, right? And part of the work was, um, for whatever reason, the prior owner or prior tenant, I'm not sure, had busted a bunch of holes in a bunch of walls. Um, so it, one of those things that, okay, then we find someone that's good at drywall, they come in, they hang new drywall, they mud and sand and all that. Um, what I didn't think about at the time was that the furnace filter that was in there was probably already um, not recently changed if the way that the previous person kept the house was to bust holes in the walls. Um, <laughs> and then the act of doing drywall finishing also creates a lot of dust, sure. gets in the filter. And so that went on for weeks and weeks. And, and I just didn't think about doing that. So we could have replaced a $5 furnace filter a few times. And that probably would have been a lot better for the furnace. And I'm certainly not a furnace expert, but my vague understanding is that <laughs> if you don't change the filter, it's bad for the furnace, right? And so what happened was we we put this house on the market. Uh, this was a, a, a project we ended up deciding to sell. We put it on the market. We, um, the, the offers, the showings, everything was going well. The, they sent in the buyer's home inspector and the buyer's home inspector walked into a cold house mm. and I was like, what's wrong? And pronounced the furnace dead at that point. So we ended up having to, uh, have a furnace installed that time a little more urgently because it had to happen during the inspe inspection period and before closing for the, 
for the new buyer. So yes, there are things like making sure that during the rehab process, you're paying attention to the little details like furnace filters and making sure that you're you're keeping up with the with the property like that. I do feel like a five dollar furnace filter though is a uh, a good little detail for a detail oriented pharmacist to catch. Like, come yes. on, David. <laughs> that, yes, yes, good. yeah. If you're listening to this and you are rehabbing house, doing drywall right now, like stop at Home Depot or somewhere <laughs> like that and grab a furnace filter today because yeah, I learned that one the hard way for sure. I'm a big fan of um, Auto Ship on Amazon. You can do like their their uh, mm. auto refills or whatever, and so you can actually have them shipped right to the house. And so I'll set them up on every, you know, four months or every six months or whatever. And I'll just have them shipped to the house for that particular furnace filter so that it's, it's totally hands off. I can get it done that way. I love that trick. Perfect. I love it. Yeah. Um, another one we were talking about before we get started was, uh, roofs because you've had, Ah, you've had some roof issues and even, uh, insurance issues related to roofs, right? Because roofs are another one that feels very expensive. Yeah. So this was one that, that, um, I was always nervous about, right? Like I knew that, that, so we bought this property and this was uh, actually the, the very first property we, we bought and we knew going in the roof was going to need to be replaced at some point. Uh, it just, the, it was a three layer roof. It had the original uh, shake shingles as the very bottom layer. Like we knew it was a problem. The roof on top was in okay shape, but, but it was a, it was a definite known issue. Um, and so we were kind of just waiting to to get to a good season to be able to replace that. Anyway, well, way before we were expecting it, uh, got a text in the morning from a tenant and it was raining that morning because I don't live that far away from this property and uh, raining that morning. And they sent a picture of water dripping into their kitchen. And I'm like, ah, I don't know where this is from. This could be from the bathroom upstairs. This could be from the roof. This could be like, who do I even call? Um, and so that was, mm-hmm. that was overwhelming, but I was like, it's raining. We know the roof is bad. Let's start there and work our way down. And so I, uh, called a couple of roofers, basically the first person that took my call that said, Hey, yeah, I can stop over today to take a look at it and at least throw a tarp on it if I need to I'm like, all right, great. Let's work together. So I, that's, again, that's kind of the first steps that I took. Uh, long story short, they eventually, I, I had a couple of different people out there to take a look at it. And all of them agreed, like, you've got way too many shingles. Or the, the, the layers on here are just, just really not good for this roof. And it's it's about time to go. And it's time to get it replaced. Um, and so we had a couple of quotes come out. Um, and part of that quote process was to actually file an insurance claim. And some of that was because, again, we knew the roof was bad, but there had also been a windstorm pretty recently. And so the thought was, well, maybe that did some damage. Let's have the insurance adjusters out just to see if we can get something out of this or if it's if it's worth filing a claim. Well, long story short, again, had the insurance people out. They looked at it. They said, yeah, we can cover this, but it's only going to be, I think it was like $1,200 worth of coverage from the insurance on what was going to be a $12,000 roof replacement. And so my deductible on that was like $1,000. So they would have basically covered 200 bucks and it would have been a hit on my insurance. I did math with my um, my insurance broker and the hit we would have gotten from the the no claims discount that we got, the two hundred dollars would have been eaten in like two months across all of our properties. So we had to like back out the insurance claim and and pay for all of it in cash because it was not something that again was going to be worth filing an insurance claim for. But I didn't know any of that until I went into it. I I've never filed an insurance claim before. So again, all of that was just a stepwise process of, okay, let's see what's next. Let's get some advice from people who know, and let's move on from there. And uh, we, again, we figured it all out, but it was, a, it was a heck of a journey to get that one sorted. Well, and, and I like how you just like started somewhere, mm-hmm. right? Like you didn't know if it was a plumbing issue or a roof issue, but like what's what's the downside of calling a roofer? Like a roofer comes out there and says like, your roof isn't bad. Like that's actually kind of a, a good thing. It, it feels again, different than how, uh, you know, in the pharmacy world, you give a terribly wrong med that can have a terribly wrong, but if you just have the wrong contractor out, it might cost you a hundred bucks for the roofer to come out and say your roof isn't bad. So it ends up where mistakes like that or wrong moves like that just aren't catastrophic. It's figure outable. And we, again, it, it, to start off, right. I worked with the tenant to say like, let's try to trace this leak and see if we can find it. And again, we, we just could not figure, it did not seem like it was coming from any of the bathrooms that d- there was no reason for that leak to be where it was. So it was at that point it became uh, all right, well, we need to get a professional to, to start looking at it and let's start top down. And so that just made the most sense. Yep. Yep. All right. So th- those are two 
basically plumbing issues for me, two water related issues that were pretty easy to figure out. But David, I want to go to what most people freak out about, right? And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna flip it right to you, right? Problems with toilets and and sewage lines. <laughs> Tell me about the issue you had that we were talking about before. Yeah. So there's always like the, you know, the 2 a.m. toilet right. like fear that everybody has, which sure, like it, it's no fun to have to handle a toilet issue at 2 a.m. Um, the one that happened to us that was a little scarier that again, like <laughs> sounds like catastrophic is not just the toilet and not just a drain line, but we had the main sewer drain going from the house to the street that stopped. Mm. And I got a call from the property manager saying, I'm standing in the basement of your house and I'm standing in some dirty water. Uh, we have a problem. That's awful. Yeah. There's, there's really like no part of that that's good for anybody <laughs> because I feel like the, the tenant, like that, that is no good for them. We know it's going to be an expensive mistake. The property manager was telling me, you know, you have this really big tree in your front yard. Um, and it's quite possible that roots from that tree have gone into the main drain line and obstructed it. That could have caused the backup. Like, you know, this, it, it starts to be one of those things where like your blood pressure is rising quickly as you're getting that call, you know? Yeah. So, so, okay. So that call comes in, right. And again, this is most people's worst nightmare. Most people picture real estate and they picture this moment of like, you're standing in boots in like, you know, four inches yeah. of sewage water. So like, what do you do to like figure out that problem all of a sudden? Well, and again, I think we keep going back to like, you don't necessarily need to know the solution. You need to know the person that has the solution. Mm -hmm. And in this case, talking with the property manager, like it was it, for being a terrible situation for everybody, it was still like oddly enough, a great phone call because that property manager was like, here's what I think is wrong. Mm -hmm. I've already called two different people oh, wow. that do sewer clean out and drain replacements. Um, one of them uh, can be here tomorrow. And based on the measurements and the description I gave them, they've bid this based on the measurements and description. The other person bid this. They're about a week and a half out and they're more money. Are you okay if I hire the person that's cheaper and can be here tomorrow to solve this? And by the way, I've also got someone that can come and can clean out the space professionally to make sure that everything is is safe and good. Wow. So maybe And all they really want is my permission to handle it. Yeah. So maybe the trick is not to... Uh be able to figure things out, but to know the person who can figure things out. Right. Yeah. That ended up being, um, and you know, we had even set up with that property manager. I know it's pretty common in property management contracts for there to be some sort of threshold mm -hmm. where if the, if the repair is estimated to be below X, like don't, don't bother the owner in that situation. Right. Like if, if the, you know, the doorknob is loose and you have a handyman over, like, I don't really want a bit of like, that'll be a half hour of my time. And like, I just want them to like handle it and just yeah. tell me later that it happened and it was handled. Um, but in this case, like it was good to get a, a phone call and it was good to to know about that. And, and it was reasonable that they wanted a larger expense approved. But, um, and I know that prices like this can vary drastically in different areas. Um, in the market where I invest a main sewer line like this is, you know, generally under $5,000. So Yes, it's a big deal. Yes, that's a chunk of money. Yes, that's why you have to have an emergency fund or access to funds or something like that because those kind of things do happen and there's not a lot of of warning for something like that in some cases, but um in the end it was it was figure outable because there was a professional on the other end of the phone that figured it out for me and that was super helpful. Yeah, I love it. I I I think there's a lot of value in having that pro that you can bounce some ideas off of. As somebody who does self-management and out-of-state property management, again, it's it's really nice, especially with the out-of-state stuff where I don't have the the same Rolodex of people like I do here locally, to have a pro that I can go to and bounce ideas off of or just trust to get stuff handled. I just that, it's really nice. So I think that you know, we share four examples like this that can all come off as kind of scary, right? Like these are, you know, a thousand dollars or more. No one, no one likes that phone call that like, Hey, your, your investment that you were hoping was going to make you money ends up costing you this month because you've got a big expense like that. So, I mean, nobody likes that. And, and hopefully we didn't just lose like everyone that was <laughs> listening to this show, but hopefully this is just a little bit of just the reality of like, these things do happen. Anyone that's owned a house has had things go wrong at their own house. So yes, it's logical to think that things would go wrong 
at a rental house as well. But I think that a few things that that make this easier, like um, one on that list is that generally everybody involved has a shared interest in getting things fixed, mm -hmm. right? Like the tenant there wants to help. Like they, they obviously don't want sewage in their basement or they don't want leaky pipes or they don't want the roof leaking. They don't, they don't want these kind of issues. They want that fixed. Like the property manager is, is there, like that's their job is to make sure that things like this are handled on the owner side, on the contractor side. Like nobody wants to come in and do a bad job or anything. Like everybody wants to get it handled, get it fixed. And so that, that shared interest and that kind of collaborative spirit when these things happen, like that's, that generally makes it a little easier and has people working constructively in the same direction. Yeah. I think that's super important and, and realize that again, you're not in this alone, right? You have professionals around you, whether that's your property manager or contractors um, or others that you can talk to, right? David, I can't tell you how many times that I've called you for a random problem. Like, Hey, how would you approach this? Like, what have you done in the past for this? Uh, and it's just a great way to bounce ideas off somebody else that might've dealt with it. Right. So I encourage you guys, you've got the entire YFP REI community that you can throw stuff at to if you've got problems, but, but realize that a lot of the things that we're talking about and almost every headache that you're going to run into or every hiccup that you're going to run into in real estate investing, it's figure out a bowl as long as you've got a plan and an approach, right? Don't expect nothing. Don't, don't go into the, the real estate investing expecting everything to go well, right? It's not always going to. But if you have that mindset that once it does go wrong, you can take a stepwise approach to fixing it, it will become much less stressful. Yeah. And oddly enough, paradoxically, I feel like even hearing stories like this and hearing the reality of this starts to bring that down. If there's not this like bar of perfection that you have right. to jump and figure out like these things happen and, and, you know, Nate, obviously, yeah, we have talked several times through <laughs> these kind of things. Right. And, and I know you've been able to connect with people and find that Rolodex as a realtor. Another thing that I've done locally is just attending local real estate meetups where you meet other investors and you hear their horror stories, but how they came through it. And then you, uh, you connect with other contractors and that can help to build that Rolodex as well. So, um, not only connecting with, uh, you know, folks online, but connecting with folks in person as well can be a can be a great strategy for developing those connections so that you can solve problems like this when when they come up. Great tips, David. Well, hope you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully we didn't scare anybody off, like David said. But again, the goal here with the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast is to present it like it is, right? We want to talk about the reality of real estate investing to encourage you guys to look at it as an option, right? It's not going to be a fit for everybody, but we think it's a fit for a lot of people out there. And so this is us trying to keep it as real as, as we possibly can. If you've got a story that you want to share uh, either on the show or in the Facebook group, we encourage you to do that. Whether it's a, a horror story of a problem gone wrong and how you fixed it or a problem you're dealing with right now that you're just looking for some advice on, we'd love to hear more about it. Again, you can reach out to us on the YFP Real Estate Investing Facebook page or you can head on over to yfprealestate.com, connect with David and myself. Uh, again, we'd, just, we'd love to hear from you guys. So hope you enjoyed the show. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks for listening to the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you like what you heard on today's show, please leave us a review and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. If you have a question, know someone that would make a good guess or want to connect with Nate or David, head on over to yfprealestate.com and join the growing YFP Real Estate Investing Facebook group. As we conclude this week's episode of the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast, an important reminder that the content in this podcast is provided to you for your informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding materials should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archived newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on this podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist, unless otherwise noted, and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. 
Thank you for your support of the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. Have a great rest of your week.